Hello everyone. Thanks for tuning into the Rain Matter podcast where we speak to some of the best and brightest founders and investors from the startup world. My guest today is Ashutosh Dattar, the co-founder of India Data Hub. It's a data and insights platform for economic and financial data. Ashutosh was an analyst at Morgan Stanley and an economist at IAFL where he started India Data Hub as a passion project which later turned into a full-fledged startup. India Data Hub also publishes a fascinating annual publication called the India Data Book which gives you a sweeping overview of the Indian economy. It contains rich insights on demographics, agriculture, infrastructure, banking, capital markets and much more. So I caught up with Ashutosh to talk about the events that led to the birth of India Data Hub and also discuss some of the highlights from the data book. I absolutely enjoyed chatting with Ashutosh and I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation as much as I did recording it. Hey Ashutosh, thank you so much for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me over. It's lovely. To so, you know, uh we have the second half of the conversation is really interested but uh, let me start with the first half first and you know get to know you a little bit so sure uh let's start right at the start and then tell us how you ended up where you are today a bit of your origin story if you will <laughs> all right okay so uh i uh i mean if i go really back it's it's a series of accidents it's it's uh, one mm-hmm. of my most favorite uh, uh uh things that i hear is that steve jobs uh, stanford uh, commencement address and uh, he says uh, i'm just going to tell you three stories that's it and one of the most important story that it has been in my mind is that the dots always connect in hindsight uh and uh, as sort of any sort of person uh, going up in the 80s early 90s your career essentially was you will study you will go take science uh you will study engineering and uh, you will end up with uh, let's say because i come from bombay you will go with lnt or reliance or something of that sort or you get into software and you go abroad and and work in 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 some software job uh it's strangely some coincidences i ended up taking commerce ended up taking accounting uh ended up having a fascination for capital markets uh ended up doing mba landed up first job with jp morgan doing equity research fascinated with it uh ended up with uh, IFL spent almost 11 years with them uh doing uh, doing research and uh, yeah sort of at some point of time you say that uh, okay i've done uh, what i wanted to i've sort of got bored a bit uh i need something different in life and uh, so that's how sort of india data hub is, is started and sort of, that's why sort of i guess i am here talking to you got it so uh, what was the role exactly at uh, you know ifl i'm, I'm guessing that's where you uh, spent a good chunk of your career yeah so f- uh, 2007 up until uh, 2018 so about 11 years uh, i was sort of started typically as an associate to to a lead analyst then you become the lead analyst yourself uh, so i became the economist did a bit of equity strategy thematic research uh, largely macro stuff which is what i used to do at jp morgan as well so sort of in a sense i've throughout uh the equity research career largely done sort of macro research thematic research uh so that's uh, that's what i've done for about 12 13 years on the same side okay let me ask you an odd question about your time at ifl so what is the day in, in the life of an economist in an institutional desk look like <laughs> like how boring to how interesting is it <laughs> so uh, uh, it is depending on how you see it uh, uh what happens typically is that uh, you have two distinct uh or three distinct hats that you wear so one is you are tracking the high frequency data commenting on that understanding what's happening with the economy how that might impact with let's say interest rates or inflation or 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 what how that might impact uh, corporate earnings for example so that's sort of the high frequency data mo- monitoring of that and sort of interacting sort of passing on that with the other research members who see a slightly different picture who see more a bottom up picture in terms of what the companies are telling them uh so that's the sort of the one hat uh, that you wear the other hat is obviously client facing if you are a writing analyst or if you are a senior analyst uh you are on the phone uh, talking to people meeting people uh doing road shows uh, traveling uh, extensively and and sort of communicating in a sense uh, your views your thoughts uh, thoughts to clients and the third hat is sort of the thematic research which is where you try and sort of do a bit of crystal gazing and see okay 3 years out 4 years out 5 years out what are the big trends that uh, client should be watching out for or sort of analyst should be on top of it and 
how that might impact let's say is the fmcg sector likely to see a bit of a change is it likely to see uh, tailwinds is it likely to see headwinds so sort of what's happening with the it sector if the rupee is going to depreciate is that good news bad news so sort of slightly longer term crystal uh, crystal ball gazing so that's sort of roughly the sort of the three hats uh, that you wear got it so i think one interesting skill that you might need when you're you know pouring through all these data sources mm-hmm. and all these data releases is like the uh, the skill to judge what's right and what's wrong like throughout your career like how did that evolve in the sense that because there are hazard data releases in a given yeah. month but how yeah. do you filter uh, the noise and then you know get the signal yeah i guess that's that's something that you sort of cultivate over a period of time uh, that uh, sort of which data is relevant uh, and within that when is a particular data release of that data set sort of relevant it's either signifying a change in trend a change in trajectory etc so it's so sort of largely uh, judgmental uh, that you that you develop i mean for example uh, inflation for example you will see inflation sort of going up newspapers will will make a big story out of it and then you look into data and you say it's sort of vegetable onion prices which are going and you say okay onion prices sort of go through this very very high uh, oscillation they might go to 100 rupees a kilo or they might crash to 5 rupees a kilo and you've been sort of every two or three years we see that cycle so there is nothing that uh, that uh, as an economist or as a as an investor you should be worried about you should sort of look through the data so it's sort of a judgment that you develop for a period of time but maybe it's something to do with rural wage growth or some some other factor that you see structural uh, and then you say hey sort of uh, inflation is going up but it's going for factors that i probably think are durable uh, or likely to go sustain so you should take a note of it and and evolve your uh, your thesis uh, in the way you are either investing or or borrowing or 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 lending etc so it's sort of to extend judgment to the extent uh, to an extent depends on sort of uh, granularity of data that you can access and sort of blend that both got it so you left the action packed world of institutional uh, research and today you are the uh, you know founder of india data hub so tell us what india data hub is and also more importantly you know what was that uh, the initial seed which sparked the idea of uh, india data hub uh, so i quit uh, ifl in 2018 and it was sort of you sort of sort of happens so when you done something for 10 years and you so one of the problems sort of that happens in equity research sort of career is that there is no growth per se uh, in a corporate uh, sort of life you might start you learn hierarchy you might become the vp senior vp uh, md etc etc there are hierarchies responsibilities that you take so your role in a sense keeps on evolving but as an equity research it's true for economists it's true for any other sort of analyst that you essentially are doing the same thing uh, pretty much day in and day out uh some people like the kick that that they get out of it and some people over a period of time sort of get bored of bored of it uh sort of and that's essentially what happened uh and then sort of one fine day i said let's try and do something around data uh because that's something that uh, i have been doing for the past uh, 12 years that's probably something that i understand a bit better uh so we started that as a as a hobby i guess india data hub essentially was a hobby let's see where it goes sort of a, sort of an idea in sort of early 2019 when we started uh sort of july august 2020 when we sort of first had our first book uh, and somebody approached us and say hey can you license this for us that's when it sort of hit us that uh, maybe we can monetize it and it sort of uh, no longer just hobby project that's when it sort of became a bit more serious uh, as a business it sort of evolved from just being a hobby where we were getting a kick out of doing what we were doing uh, to now sort of where it's sort of slightly uh, serious business uh, business venture that we're doing So, what does the team look like today, and what are the backgrounds uh, of the, the, the of the founding team? Uh, so, uh, I, as as you know, come from the sales side institutional uh, sort of background. Uh, my partner Pranoti, she comes with a tech background. Uh, she's worked with JP Morgan and and Oracle and Infosys and all of that, largely on the technology domain. So, so she leads the the technology side for us. I look at the data side for us. uh we have duty and anisha sort of uh, work who work with me on the on the data side and there is a couple of people akshay and uh, uh akshay and uh, zuli on the on the technology side so we are sort of six people couple of interns uh sort of uh, sort of eight nine member team as of now got it um so the first time i came across india data was actually by a tweet from professor sanjay bakshi so i was looking for oh. some data and then it was it was a nightmare so then i went to the website and there was some public resources pdf that you guys had put out and there was 
if i remember that old version of the website was there was a landing page full of yeah, yeah, yeah. open data points so and it made yeah, yeah, my yeah. life simpler at that point of time and then i was wondering <laughs> yeah. uh, you know why doesn't something like this exist so if you were to sort of step back and look at the competitive landscape uh, i know it sounds like a scary word but like who who are you competing against and what does that landscape look like today because everybody says data 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 and yeah right, it's almost become a meaningless buzzword <laughs> so uh, actually i we don't think sort of think in terms of competing against uh, against someone uh, what we're trying to do is something pretty different so i mean if you look at it sort of slightly bigger picture uh, in terms of providing data there are vendors out there who provide people with uh, access to data they are both domestic uh, firms as well as uh, large global uh, platforms including the likes of bloomberg and reuters and all of that so you have pretty much the entire spectrum where uh, sort of uh, access to data is concerned some of them uh, uh, do a de- decent job some of them are very expensive so across different price points uh, and across different uh, use cases and all that but what we are trying to do is something different so we are not in a sense being a database company uh, i think that's, that's something that we are trying to different so so data is sort of the raw material and what we are trying to do is is help people uh, or help uh, uh, users understand that data uh, contextualize that data and sort of make their life uh, simple by saying okay these are not the things that you need to worry about these are the things that you need to worry about so uh, in, in that sense our role uh, uh, is is not as a provider of data uh, but as somebody who curates data contextualizes data Uh, and visualize or present that data in in a manner that reduces the clutter and noise. I think I think the the problem uh, that I, I see uh, over the last uh, few years that I've interacted people is that people get put off by data because it, it becomes so complex. Uh, and I think what we are trying to do is to take that complexity out and say, okay, there might be a hundred thousand indicators out there uh, that uh, that might exist, but that is not what you. Uh, that that is not what you need these are just the 10 indicators uh, for example that you need to track if you are if you need to be on top of let's say banking or if you want to be on top of telecom uh, that's essentially the role that we are providing uh, and sort of data as in a sense becomes rather than input rather than the output for us this will sound like a weird question but uh, like you mentioned this you know giants in the space right from everybody yeah. from let's say cmie snp to your bloomberg's Uh, and you also mentioned an interesting point in the sense that you guys aren't really a database company you guys are more uh, synthesizing the data and presenting it in an actionable form or more uh, digestible form yeah like but yeah in a weird way have you thought about why nobody has done this in the space uh, in india because we are in 2022 today and yeah this is a pain point in the sense that any reason why none of these established giants haven't uh, attempted to do this uh i think two or three reasons one is that uh, i don't think even they know if the market for what we are trying to do exists uh, for us it's also an idea uh, so 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 we are working with an hypothesis that a market uh, market exists for that and and we'll see and sort of we'll find out if the market really does exist so so they also don't know whether the if they knew that a market really exists and a reasonably large market they probably would have wanted uh, wanted to that that is a b uh, i think they have the large corporate uh, sort of uh, clients in a sense whom they sell bulky subscriptions and if you make it uh, piecemeal uh, then uh, you sort of end up having sort of losing revenue on the sort of large uh, corporate uh, institution because the a large corporate uh, might pay for a corporate subscription with only two people in the team who might who might uh, who might be consuming that and for them Uh, a fraction of if it's you offer individual retail subscription they might take for that so your revenue in a sense you end up bit of cannibalizing your existing uh, sort of revenue base so i can think of sort of those two being sort of the large the reason why anybody sort of people have not done it and i think in a in a large sense uh, it is also a function of inner sense you don't done something uh, a certain way for the last 10 15 20 years some of these firms are like 30 40 year old uh, firms and you 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 are have a standing in the market you are large uh then wanting to change something drastically uh is is not easy uh it is not easy so you so the whole process is system everything is set up in a certain way uh and there is no pressing need to change uh just the business continues so then let let the status quo continue in a sense so i guess uh, these are the sort of reasons why nobody tried the what we are trying right makes sense um to your point about even you guys trying to validate this hypothesis as to whether there is a market for what you guys are doing Mm-hmm. um two years into two three years into what you guys are doing like do you have a sense that there is uh, you know a large enough audience that uh, will pay for the services and uh, you know on the tools that you guys uh, are building 
Yes, I think uh, sort of so far we've been uh, we've been uh, uh, we've, we've been happy with the the, the response that that uh, we've got. Uh, so I think as things stand now, I think uh, there is reason to believe that uh, the path that we are going on to is, is the right path. Uh, how big the market is uh, and uh, sort of uh, uh, we will will figure out. But I think the early signs, in a sense, it's like sort of the election day, ten o'clock. Uh, you said early trends are encouraging, so it's sort of uh, sort of that. Got it. On on the same note, you know, there's that old Charlie Munger quote: "Always invert." So if you were to invert and potentially think, you know, what could potentially disrupt India? I know it's too early in the journey for the question of disruption. Yeah. Uh, but if you just flip the question, uh, now have you thought about what's that that the next you know big idea that could potentially disrupt this whole data space, so to speak, or the space that you guys play? Uh, sure. So uh, I, I don't think we think in terms of disrupt because when you use the word disrupting something, you sort of emphasize that there is a large existing incumbent, which is sort of either sort of a sitting duck out there and then an upstart comes in and takes it head on and, and, and sort of defeats us. We are too small for somebody to disrupt us in a sense. I think uh, sort of if you, I mean, if I were to give an example of let's say an Amazon, which started in 1997 and you had an existing setup called the Borders or Walmart, etc., where you could go and buy books. Sort of the Amazon started with an hypothesis that uh, the way you buy books currently, which is you go to a big store, you sample different titles, you maybe read the first few pages and you bought a book. That's the setup uh, that was in the mid 90s. But people would rather prefer to just order it online and, and sort of that convenience is what, what people were after. And Amazon started, in a sense, with that hypothesis that there is a large enough market which craved for that convenience, uh, and they were proved right. So, in a sense, what what sort of we are doing is we are going with the hypothesis that there is a large enough market which will want uh, to understand data, contextualize that data. Uh, somebody who presents the data sort of uh, analyzes data uh, without it being clickbait, without it being uh, something that is uh, over the top, etc. And there is a large enough market. So, what can go wrong for us is that we there isn't a large enough market uh, which could either be that. Uh, people want uh, ready-made investment ideas. For example, what we are not doing is, is in the business of investment advice. Uh, so there isn't a large enough market uh, for that. Uh, or we or that uh, there is probably a market, but we are too early. The market might be out there five years down the line. We might be a bit too early for that. So I think we like every sort of startup, we're starting with a presumption that there is a there is a need uh, for a, for what we are trying to do. Uh, and it may be that uh, that we are mistaken and there isn't a large enough uh, audience. Uh, a lot enough market for for what we are trying to do. So, what if anything can go wrong? It's either that, or be that there is a market, but we can't, we couldn't execute it, and somebody else comes along and does a far better job at executing it. So, it's either that uh, we got the market wrong, or we couldn't execute it, rather than in terms of somebody sort of disrupting us. I think it's sort of uh, too small for somebody to disrupt. Got it. Uh, if you were to step back and. Also, I think, you know, people in fintech will really appreciate these questions because they deal, their entire life uh, revolves around CSVs. I think internally, uh, someone from a tech team says, we are, we are in the business of importing CSVs. Uh, <laughs> and we are not really as, you know, a fintech company, but we are a CSV importing company. And your life revolves around CSVs. Uh, you know, yeah. just at a big picture level. So how hard it is to collate all the data? I mean, you guys must be reading and parsing hundreds and thousands of sources. Uh, what does that yeah. you know that that landscape look like? How bad is the data that you guys consume? What are the pain points that uh, you guys deal with when you guys are cleaning up, sanitizing the data, and making it presentable? How how bad is it, or how good is it? Uh, it's getting better actually. Uh, so sort of the glass is, as they say, perennially half full. So in a sense, you can look at the upside or you can look at the bad side. I think uh, things have improved. Uh, significantly in the last few years, but there are still significant challenges. The data is, I mean, as something as basic as that, uh, the, there is no fixed date on which data gets released. Uh, for certain departments of the government, for example, we'll have a specific date, okay, 5.30 p.m. On the 12th, you will get the CPI data. If it's a holiday, it will be on the 13th. If it's a holiday, you'll get 14th. It's sort of, uh, sort of set like, uh, sort of uh, uh, set uh, line in stone. Uh, but that is by and large very very far and few in between by and large most departments the data gets released the date is approximate it's something that we sort of have. so we have an economic calendar for our website that data is largely based on our judgment as to when the data is likely to be released in in most uh, in most cases so that sort of is sort of one of the problems the other problem for example is that the reporting units differ across departments and sometimes the same department will change i mean so rbi up until a few years back used to report data in billions and billions uh, one fine day, three, four years back, they just changed it. Overnight data got released in crores and lakhs. 
and sort of the, everything that we had set up, everything went for a toss because we couldn't figure out what was happening. And when we dug into the sort of source data and find that okay, the data is not in billions in quotes, and we were sort of wondering why everything is down 95 percent and 99 percent. The world is not coming. To <laughs> so it's sort of something as simple as that. And then you have some government departments still re releasing data in millions, some in some in billions. Some will still report scanned PDFs rather than uh, sort of an Excel uh, Excel or a CSV. So so it, 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 it's so you can think of it as being bad, but if I look at over the last ten or fifteen years that I have worked with this, uh, I think I can say that uh, things were worse before, and things are things are getting better. And uh, if if they continue to get better, it makes our life a lot easier. Got it. Uh, also, broadly speaking, I think there's this move towards open data, quote unquote, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. So be it unlocking data, it could be something as like open banking in the UK and. Uh, also unlocking data that resides inside institutions, for example, the account aggregator framework. And also the government also, I think, is making some attempts with, uh, I think, uh, I don't know when was the exact date, it was the data GOV portal where they tried to make this yeah. work cleaner. So is yeah. like is that move happening in the sense and how does that, uh, how does it change life for you guys in the sense that governments and institu institutions trying to make uh, data more open and more cleaner? Oh, absolutely. I, I think there is a there is a there is a thrust and a determination on the part of the government to make this happen. Uh, and there are steps being taken in that direction. So we see a lot more uh, data out there which we can access, uh, which uh, hitherto wasn't the case. So uh, I am quite optimistic that uh, if I look at five years down the line, uh, the data, the landscape for data will will change. And I think I am sort of hoping that a stage comes when sort of the government will start releasing data in machine readable format that. We don't have to spend a lot of time and resources in cleaning and sanitizing the data, and we can sort of focus a lot of our energy on just saying how do we make sense of that data and how do we sort of present that data in, in the most user friendly format. So if we have to just focus on that, uh, we'll be we'll be we'll be very happy if that were to happen. And sort of the more the data out there, in a sense, the more the opportunity for us because there is so much more uh, data that we can help uh, make sense of. So I think sort of more data is always uh, better for good for us. Uh, and if it is presented in a in a far more accessible manner, even that's that's also sort of uh, helps us uh, in being able to present that data and and uh, sort of make it make uh, make sense of that data. Got it. Uh, so on that sense, let's assume that in an ideal world, everything is clean. There are no scanned images of PDFs and Excel's, and then data is as clean as it could be. Uh, yeah. If in that ideal world, do you think? then there is still a large enough market for somebody like you who's making sense of the data because I'm thinking of the recent inflation report that you guys put out and it had a really quick yeah. snapshot of what happened, you know, what were the changes across categories, which I can't really, for the life of me, find it on some government website or RBA website and make sense of it quickly uh, if I'm acting on something. In that, in that ideal world, then does your role become more about synthesizing the data and ensuring there are actionable insights rather than just presentation? Uh, not really. So, uh, in an ideal world that you describe, I think uh, our focus will so access to data will no longer be D and H uh, because the data is accessible to any any anyone uh, easily. You don't have to struggle uh, to find find for data. So that does not. But uh, the 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 what the, the presenting of the data, the making sense of that data, uh, that still remains a challenge, and that that still remains an opportunity that hey, we can help you make sense of the data better than somebody else. So that's essentially, in any sense, sort of that's essentially what we are trying to do. We're not trying to say that we have data that is unique. The data is not unique. The data is out there. We're just uh, presenting it or or helping you trying to make sense of that data, rather than saying that we have some proprietary data. The data that we use is not proprietary. Uh, what we are trying to do is saying we, we help you make sense of the data, we help you make understand the data, and we can help you tell you don't, uh, give you the context behind the data. Hey, last year this happened, and hence this year's data. We should be interpreting it with caution and not sort of jump the gun and, and say that okay, all hunky dory or everything is bad and, and sort of that. So sort of that role of ours, in a sense, which we are trying to sort of take, sort of still remains. It just makes our life easier because we have to worry less and spend less time and resources in the back end in getting that data, processing and data. Uh, so uh, that that's the way I look at Got it. it. Today, who uses your data? You guys are a B two B only company, and you, uh, from whatever I've spoken to, you have no plans of either doing B two C in any immediate. So, uh, in you know, in the immediate uh, future. So today, who uses your data, and how do they use it? You know, just to get a broad sense of. So so, the the large uh, sort of users will be the corporates, so the sort of the businesses in a sense, the sort of the analyst community in a sense, the power right. users. As you call it, who need the Excel plugin, who need the sort of the data, uh, 
uh, as and when it's released and 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 stuff like that. But we do have we do have a subscription live, for example, for all the for the analysis that we produce, not for the underlying data, uh, which is which I, I I I suspect is not of much use to the to the ordinary layman to be able to access. uh the the sort of the tens of thousands of indicators but the sort of the uh the content or the analysis that we produce uh we produce uh, quite a bit of stuff uh, every week three four times a week uh, so that is uh, accessible uh, through a b2c uh, subscription uh, and the book for example part of that subscription can be purchased separately uh, but the entire platform in a sense which includes the api access the excel plugin the dashboards and all of it uh is uh, is largely targeted at the b2b uh, audience Uh, so, if you were to step back and you know just take a broader view of the landscape today that you guys operate in, and if you were to think about any white spaces where there's a lot that could be done that could potentially help businesses, governments, analysts, etc. Like, are there any white spaces that come to your mind? Oh, so in terms of the data coverage, there is there is uh, so much of stuff that we still have to do. I mean, we sort of barely scratch the surface in terms of uh, sort of is. covering the data uh, so we for example are building a district product for example which is uh, we sort of collate all the district level data that we that we can and you so you can in a sense uh, understand at a very micro level sort of what's happening or sort of where different uh, so is 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 jaipur for example a, a more prosperous market or is jodhpur a more prosperous sort of region for example uh, sort of some of those questions for example can be answered better with with a, a more granular data than let's say just a state level data Uh, so that's sort of one of the spaces that that uh, we will get into uh, sort of later this year. Uh, corporate data, the whole scheme for corporate data, and then sort of doing analysis based on that uh, is again something that uh, we will be doing uh, later this year. Uh, so those are just sort of two of the white spaces, and then there is the whole area of sort of uh, alternate data, GIS, and all of that, uh, which we haven't even talked about. Uh, so that sort of becomes sort of the the third layer of data. uh so so in terms of data uh, i think uh, the the problem is what we want to do at a given point of time rather there is too much to do and sort of too little bandwidth in that sense so uh, i i don't think uh, we will run out of ideas uh, anytime soon uh, the question is whether you whether you sort of focus on something that is that is worthy and then execute it and then whether your hypothesis is that there is a market out there for for that uh, comes Correct. to i mean it's good that you mentioned alternate data because it's been like this Fancy term in the past, I don't know. Maybe call it seven, eight years. Yeah, I'm thinking these hedge funds were using the satellite data, tracking the parking lots of Walmart yeah, yeah, yeah. to, uh, I yeah. don't know, you know, tracking the heat density of the Indian this thing to figure out how the economy is doing, and then uh, investing based on that. Do you think there is things to be done in making sense of this alternate data, so to speak, or is that largely hyped? Uh, I think there is a bit of both. Uh, I think it's to some extent it's also a marketing plan. i mean if i'm a hedge fund i it's sort of if if i give away an impression that i'm using cutting edge I, I, as a hedge fund i'm also there is an eum that i am managing so it's also and i generate a fee based on a percentage of the eum so there is a bit of that also in terms of the way you want to position but the the alternate data there is a huge wide spectrum i mean something like for example we track uh, how which sectors are seeing new companies being registered or where, where is uh, where are businesses being set up in india uh and for example last two or three years uh, before this uh, the sort of the uh, uh, last four five years we've seen chemical sector being very strong uh, chemical companies going up and that was sort of consistently getting reflected quarter after quarter in new chemicals companies being formed i mean last uh, four or five years the number of new chemical companies being formed in india has gone up by four times uh in a sense that validates what you're seeing in the secondary market uh because if com- chemical companies are profitable it's logical that you will see new chemical companies being set up but equally as, as an alternate sort of if you think slightly ahead you will say if there are so many new entrants coming to the sector maybe there aren't as many entry barriers to that sector maybe some of these companies will become big and eat into the profit sort of the existing large profit pool so this in a sense becomes a signal that can be a coincident indicator or a continuous indicator depending on how do you assess the the, the cycle uh to be playing out to be so uh sort of gis is sort of one manifestation of the alternate data but something like this is the other way of looking at alternate data this is something that very few people track but this this becomes a very 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 useful uh, sort of uh, trend to track all sort of people track commute these days for example and see sort of uh, sort of what's the urbanization sort of urban urban demand trends uh, etc so there are things that you can do uh and the things that you can sort of go go overboard and say that uh, i am doing this but 
but i think there is there is there, there is space uh, and as we sort of go along uh, there will be more opportunities to, to do something in that area uh, we sort of uh, getting into it in india sort of early early days of doing that sort of in, especially in china uh, things are at a far more advanced level uh, where people pay for i sort of heard that people pay to track uh, track people's behavior in malls for example through wifi beacons and all of that so sort of things are at a far advanced stage in some of those uh, countries uh so uh, i think we'll 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 sort of getting there but uh, there will be hype and there will be some genuine use cases uh, as we go along uh, speaking of use cases i mean going back to the institutional days like how was this data digested by let's say somebody like an analyst or somebody who's allocating money in funds so on so forth mm-hmm. uh because again uh, going back to the earlier point there's so much data so uh, is mm-hmm. there i mean is there any uh, so sort of because also this you know investing and trading based on macro data is also notoriously hard and not many people have managed to do it successfully yeah. also so what's the art and science behind you know using this data to ensure that you are investing successfully like at a more philosophical level if you will so sure. i i don't think it's just about sort of macro data uh, it is also about uh, asking well whether the hypothesis that you whether the data that is coming in is sort of fits into the hypothesis that you have So let's say you might have an hypothesis, for example, that HDFC Bank is going to go profits at three percent per year for the foreseeable future, uh, and uh, and that would mean that uh, let's say their loans have to grow at twenty five percent, their deposits have to grow at let's say I don't know thirty percent, Casa has to grow at etc etc percent. So what the banking aggregate industry data will tell you is that if the banking industry is going to grow at just five percent, is it plausible for HDFC Bank to grow at twenty five percent? It may be, it may not be, but that's sort of the hypothesis. uh sort of the question that you ask whether if the industry is slowing down from 15% to 5% does it change my hypothesis that i had for hdfc bank or icici bank or 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 indusind bank uh and if it does do i need to do something about it and if it does uh, or maybe i don't need to do anything because the stock have already corrected or maybe interest rates have gone down and that offsets the the fundamental change uh, because of the lower uh, cost of capital uh, or uh, or or maybe i do need to do something then what do i need to do so it's 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 a is about that i have a hypothesis uh, or a framework in which my portfolio is built uh and sort of every sort of set, set of data that i come by sort of ask myself is this broadly in sync with with my portfolio uh, or uh, does it warrant me to change uh, something in my portfolio so let's say monsoons are going to be bad uh, and i have a very large exposure to consumer stocks so do i need to do something about it uh, or i'm just i'm a very long term investor i'm just going to write it out or i think that uh, some of these stocks are at a very frothy valuation and and they could correct uh and so i better trim down my my overweight and and sort of move into some other space for the time being and if the stocks do correct i can again go back to my 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 overweight to build my overweight position back so it's sort of also also about uh, about uh, sort of checking whether your hypothesis uh, makes sense or not sense or whether you need to take in it so one of the reasons why i asked this because there's a tendency especially among the retail investors to think oh gdp up market up uh, inflation down stocks bad and this binary thinking is it always yeah, gets people yeah. into trouble so i just wanted to get your sensitivity absolutely yeah yeah got it absolutely uh, you know taking a step back so 2 3 years into building india data from being a hobby project so to speak to a serious business today uh, like what are some learnings that you guys have had you know in building this out uh i think uh, in terms of learnings it been that uh, that uh, i mean for example i have learned some some bits of technology which i never thought i could learn for example so sort of i have added uh, so, so so that have and sort of i think vice versa uh, my sort of partner who has had nothing to do with economics has understood a bit of uh, economic data so at a sort of personal level uh, it's been but i think the bigger picture is that if uh, that uh, the the environment uh, in which uh, we operate in india has become so conducive for for somebody to start a business there is a support environment uh, whether it is funding whether it is advice whether it is uh, simply going finding a place to work with this whole uh, co-working places that in a sense some of the risks that are typically associated with uh, starting out uh, and starting a business uh, i think some of the downside risks have to some extent being being mitigated and i think uh, it's something that you knew as an economist at an abstract level but when you are right in the middle of it uh, yeah, and sort of be exposed to it uh, uh, as an entrepreneur uh, i think you experience it first hand and sort of you realize uh, the 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 impact that it has 
and equally i think on the flip side it sort of you sort of realize that there is a lot of talk of let's say ease of doing business but how far are we still off from some sort of that idealistic uh, environment in which uh, compliance has become easier or or sort of it's easier to, to start a business or to do x or do y uh, that while we could have we, we have taken steps but it's still a long way to go where uh, it becomes very very easy for for somebody to start a let's say start a company run a company and sort of execute it and so it's sort of uh, being sort of it's it's been a very fascinating thing correct so as an economist and a, also as a data analyst you are you look at companies in the aggregate for example but on the flip side as a founder you are an input into the very data that you analyze does you know has it you know does it wearing that hat of an economist help you in terms of uh, you know making business decisions or uh, you know anything related to building in the data has that has it been useful uh yes and no uh, it's been yes to the extent that uh, you sort of uh, have a certain mindset with which you enter a business uh so i sort of come i'm sort of, as a student of sanjay bakshi for example from a very very conservative uh sort of a background when it comes to investing uh, uh focus on cash flow focus on 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 some of those things uh and you sort of apply that sort of trying business uh, so it's sort of uh, whether that's a positive or negative we'll find out but you sort of are in a sense that sort of mold of thinking uh, of 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 uh, sort of building a business so that's how it happens uh it doesn't help in the sense that when somebody asks you how are you doing and you're the first of the only 1% of the startups <laughs> so survive so you said the odds of my surviving are just 1% so you start off with that specific and then somebody says how can you survive with that mindset but i said <laughs> I, i am very very different at this point of time i hope i'm that 1% but uh, yeah sort of uh, yeah it cuts both ways got it that's interesting and, and so one of the reasons i was really really excited about having this conversation with you was uh, this publication that you guys put out this india data book which gives you a birds eye view of yeah uh, india if i'm not wrong this is the second edition right uh, yes so uh, i'm really curious like how did this idea about coming uh, you know putting out this this insanely complex and comprehensive and data rich publication come about like what was the thought process behind it? oh the thought process for this was the economist magazine publishes this pocket pocket book world book of statistics or something of that sort which typically every alternate year i would go and purchase uh, it sort of cost i think 10 pounds uh, is what it would cost uh, it's sort of most of the time it's available in india but sometimes it's not in, because you're all sort of traveling to the uk once in a while uh, every year you go and pick it up from there uh, and i sort of all always fascinated by that book uh, and sort of that's largely comes from background of being fascinated by numbers so we thought and there isn't something comparable of that sort in india so we started off by wanting to do something of that sort for india and they said we doing that uh, but why don't sort of add our own flavor to that so we sort of added our own flavor through a lot of charts this time we have some commentaries uh, and all that that sort of the product has evolved over the last uh, couple of years uh so sort of that been the inspiration for us it's sort of uh, anybody from the economist think it's a big thumbs up to what you got it um for the listeners the india data book is a really really comprehensive state of the economy across uh your macro indicators across demographics industry uh, capital markets so on so forth i'll include the link in the show notes so that you guys can go and purchase it it's absolutely fascinating uh but i just want to pick up a few things Uh, from the book just to give uh, sort of a limited teaser if you will uh, you, know, you know to the listeners uh, sort of right now we are at a very interesting moment in history like given whatever is happening in the last 2 years uh, there's that old quote that you know there are decades that happen in decades or something that effect and there are uh, that old yeah, yeah, challenge yeah. quote i'm guessing uh, so if you were to you know look at the look at from a lens of being an economist and also somebody who who, who you know spent lot of time pouring over economic indicators in preparing this book pre covid and post covid you know how is the indian economy doing today uh, are we on the road to recovery or are we in a bad spot what is your economist perspective uh, tell you uh, i think uh, uh, the indian economy in a sense has a habit of surprising people i mean one of the learnings that i have had over the last 15 years that you should never get too optimistic or too pessimistic uh so whenever you get too pessimistic about the economy like so for example a lot of people got in early 2020 when the pandemic first hit us they were all surprised uh and i think we've come out reasonably well uh, from from the pandemic uh, most indicators seem to suggest that uh, we are sort of at pre covid levels in terms of activity if not higher uh there is some bit of dispersion in activity in terms of the the rural 
uh, side of the economy still seems to be struggling a bit more compared to the, uh, the urban side. Uh, but I, I suspect that is largely a function of lead and lag. Uh, there's a large migration of people that happened from urban to rural uh, in 2020. Not everything has come back. So I think, uh, and that's because you've seen first wave, then second wave, then a mini wave this year in Jan. Uh, I'm not sure people have the confidence that we are sort of done with this for sure and for good. Uh, and we can sort of go back and not have to worry about coming back. So I guess some of these is transitional uh, sort of uh, friction, uh, etc. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, I think the economy is doing reasonably well. Uh, I think sort of the worry, if anything, is sort of what's happening globally, which fits into India in terms of uh, higher oil prices, higher commodity prices, inflation, RBI having to tighten rates, etc. Uh, these are largely cyclical. I think if you look at the next uh, sort of five, ten years south, uh, I think there is every reason to be uh, optimistic uh, that the economy should be doing well uh, over over that time frame. There will be ups and downs, but I think uh, uh, on the whole, uh, as as Mr. Buffett says about America, you should never be bearish on America. I guess it's the same holds true. You should never be sort of long term bearish on. America. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at the performance of our market from 2009, I mean, we are clearly in the top quartile of uh, in the global yeah, market. Yeah. So it has been a good measure, so to speak. Uh, there's also an interesting section on formalization of the Indian economy, broadly speaking, in the report also. Uh, like, what do the what do the numbers tell you? So, I think what was surprising to us, for example, was that through the pandemic, the pace of new firms being created in India didn't slacken at all. I mean, in FI21, which is April 2020 to March 2021, which is sort of the right. first wave, the more firms got registered that in the prior year when there was no COVID. Uh, and in F21 to 22, which was when the second wave, uh, a much more serious wave, even more number of companies uh, that got set up. And I, I sort of as I where the economist had, uh, somebody will set up a firm uh, only if he expects profits. It's with that expectation. It's not necessarily that they will get material, but it's an expectation. Uh, so if in the middle of the pandemic, when sort of your uh, everything is declining, uh, people are dying and all that, if entrepreneurs have the confidence that uh, that. Uh, we can look through these passing few months, but we can look at the long five, ten year picture. I think that is the biggest confidence that you can have on, on the economy, that people are putting their money in a sense and setting up, set up, setting up new firms. Uh, uh, and sort of that shows that uh, your GDP might be declining, uh, your industrial production might be declining, but people wouldn't set up a firm and incur the cost that uh, it sort of comes along with it unless they were optimistic uh, about the future and unless they expected uh, profits and, and production and growth uh, in, in the future. So I think the formalization trends over the last few years, it's, it's been a conscious policy uh, of the government to encourage formalization. We have something like 60 million informal businesses in the country and less than 2 million formal enterprises. Uh, so it's a huge imbalance that we have currently. Uh, and uh, you've seen the policy trust and sort of some of that sort of uh, playing out in terms of uh, terms of data. I think the number of new firms that are getting registered have doubled in the last uh, few years, uh, the number of active firms uh, adjusted for number of firms that are closing down have also increased by more than 50%. So uh, I think a, it's sort of as an economist, you want uh, firms to get bigger because when they become bigger, they hire people, they invest in new capacity. So there is investment that happens uh, and capacity. So you're seeing sort of in a sixth extent, uh, some of that uh, that happening to so sectors like manufacturing, for example, which is uh, a part of uh, sort of policy from the government, seeing significant increase in number of uh, new firms, but also in health, for example, or education, agriculture, for example, which is a big surprise to us. Uh, that a sector which is as 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 uh, sort of riddled by by uh, by friction and policy as agriculture is seeing sort of uh, so many new corporate entities being set up. This could be for trading. This could be for new uh, uh, for commercial agriculture, etc. Uh, but that tells you that there is private capital flowing into something a sector which is as unproductive as. As you can get, I mean, that sector can really benefit from from productivity boost. Uh, and if private capital is going through it as somebody who's sort of believer of free markets, uh, private capital going into a sector is always always a positive. So I think there is lots of sort of longer term positive from this whole uh, from the whole process of formalization, confidence in the economy, uh, capital going into sectors which were either too unproductive or were growing very fast. Uh, and I think that sets the stage in a sense for, for some uh, sustained uh, momentum with some cyclicality. No, that's really interesting because uh, this also speaks to the reason why you guys exist. Because 
if somebody were to go and look at the pace of you know new company creation it's very very tough to get the data you have no clue for example i was looking at this post the pandemic period and the us data is really really easy to come by um the trend mirrors there because uh, new business starts have been at record highs uh so I, and i was i was interpreting that data in the indian context and thinking it must be the same but i had no clue it was uh, oh, this this is really really amazing <laughs> and also there's a yeah quite comprehensive section on capital markets in the report which is our bread and butter uh big picture like what are the interesting trends that stand out uh, in the capital markets so to speak uh i think the big picture is that uh, uh, people are willing to put a far higher proportion of their savings into capital markets uh, uh which could be which is sort of mutual funds as well as uh, direct equity uh, uh so in a sense that sort of suggests that uh, the whole campaign by the mutual fund industry mutual fund say he hey, encouraging systematic investment flow etc uh, the, the 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 work that uh, Firms like yourself have done it, making it easier for people to directly invest in equity. So all of that. So it's a combination of people willing to take on risk, and also sort of the private sector uh, sort of in a sense responding by creating awareness and making it easier for for people to invest. Uh, so uh, I think far too long have we had a scenario where people would be content with fixed deposits, uh, uh, and uh, sort of in a sense the risk capital. uh we being reliant on foreign investors for providing that risk capital uh, but the domestic market now itself i mean last few months for example you've seen continuous mm-hmm. outflows from foreign investor uh, but sort of in a sense the entire uh, outselling being absorbed by the domestic uh, uh, investors which is largely driven by the retail flows that directly into equity or through mutual funds so that sort of suggests that the domestic market is now getting mature enough to handle the volatility that comes along with uh, with sort of the the the, the economic ups and down global news flow fred tightening etc uh, but is also an important counter buffer now to what the foreign portfolio investors might do so we are not as vulnerable to uh, their massive uh, sort of their uh, volatility in their flows uh, and also that there is now risk capital that domestic investors can make available to domestic companies uh, for their growth uh, and that cuts across not just about secondary market but equally primary market i mean we've seen a tremendous amount of funding for startups in the domestic market so i think sort of the capital markets are sort of the economy is getting financialized in a sense uh, which is uh, sort of the reliance on banking system in a sense is going down uh, and sort of the other mechanisms are going up which is again is a, is a very uh, long term positive sort of the only caveat is that uh, if you sort of have a long enough cycle uh, a lot of the arguments that you see currently uh, were made in 2007 2008 before the global financial crisis so that's good uh but uh, sort of the crisis hit us and then it sort of took us 2008 to 2014 uh before investments uh, domestic liquidity recovered so it, it's not the first time that we have making i am making the, i have as, as a uh, analyst in 2008 made exactly the same arguments that the domestic <laughs> investors are coming of age domestic liquidity uh, and all of that and then the lehman brothers went under one fine day and then uh, sort of the world changed so uh, these things can can this the, the capital markets especially are have very very deep cycles uh, sort of very sharp and very deep cycles so uh, sort of i mean next next month the picture could change but i think the data so far uh, is sort of very very encouraging uh, of the economy and the investors coming at large uh, so one segment of the listeners who uh, a big segment of the listeners of this show will be will also be this people from the startup ecosystem broadly so to speak um, and for somebody who is also building in fintech the ultimate uh, sort of data point to look at essentially becomes are there enough people with enough disposable incomes to save invest which means which will eventually feed back into the estimates of the market so on and so forth but one worrying uh, data point from the report was this decline in savings rate household savings rate and but uh, we had a secular increase from the uh, 90s but then from call it 2015 there's been a steady decline in the savings rate like what does your sense tell you as to why it is also can an inference be made saying that the savings rate is decreasing at a time when household indebtedness is increasing is that a reasonable inference to me uh to some extent uh i think the bigger driver there is is so a lot part of savings household savings goes into real estate uh and sort of the sort of the last 5 years when you see in savings rate go down it sort of coincides with the real estate industry being uh, being sort of struggling a bit so it sort of explained to a large extent by real estate as an asset uh, not being attractive enough and hence money sort of not going uh, into real estate uh, uh so i think sort of that is so in a sense it's a worry uh it's a worry because uh, 
especially for a lot of people in the capital market, look upon real estate, look down upon real estate as an investment. Uh, but the real estate, in a sense, or the construction industry, for example, is by large one of the biggest employers in the country. Uh, the labor intensity of that sector is more than manufacturing. Uh, so, in a sense, when the real estate industry is is, is sort of struggling, uh, it's also sort of the job creation at at slightly lower level uh, that is also struggling. So, in a sense, the real estate industry needs to come back. Uh, whether that means prices need to correct, inventories need to go down, etc. So, sort of that's a separate discussion. But that the health of the real estate industry is important from an economic point of view because it is a large employer of slightly lower uh, end of the so social strata. Uh, so, uh, that real estate industry being struggling is sort of largely why people haven't invested in housing and people haven't invested in housing and its savings rate, uh, in a sense, has going down. Financial savings, if you see during that period, especially in the last. Uh, sort of 2015-16 onwards, there was a couple of years of blip, but again 2020-21 financial savings have been on upward. So I don't think it's a case, uh, it's sort of something that we need to be worried about a lot, uh, but I think it's something that uh, something that we should think more from the point of view of, sort of the real estate industry. And uh, the other drag, especially in the last two years, has been the government because uh, tax revenues have been weak uh, and uh, so they've, they've had to spend because of the pandemic. Uh, and their revenues are not made, so they've in a sense had a higher deficits than what they had in, let's say, 2019 or 2018. Got it. So, uh, there isn't a specific section on startups in the report, but broadly speaking, if you were to infer, uh, you know, the data point, make inferences from the data in the report. So, one was uh, this space at, uh, of new company creation, which, as you said, is really, really heartening. Uh, the second thing was, uh, you know, domestic. Uh, financial flows more than making up for the foreign outflows. Like, are there any other uh, data points that give you a sense of how the Indian startup ecosystem is doing, uh, you know, in terms of entre entrepreneurship, so on and so forth? Uh, so the other sort of data that we have is, for example, on factories. Uh, for example, and uh, we've seen increase in number of factories in the country, and that sort of links up to the manufacturing uh, sector. Uh, there is a trust to the PLI scheme on Make in India and so on. So. So in a sense, you've seen investments in manufacturing sector that reflects in fact number of factories increasing as well as new firms in manufacturing increasing. So sort of the two data points that point uh, point uh, towards the same uh, same direction. Uh, if you look at electronic exports, for example, uh, so they've increased for many fold and that is largely again a function of uh, uh, not a startup in a classical right. sense, but uh, investments that are happening in in a, in, a, in the electronic sector, which is hitherto basically next to zero in India. So sort of that sector coming at large. And sort of typically when you see a sector which is non-existent becoming starting to become big, you will see a lot of ancillary sort of uh, companies that will sort of blow. I mean, if you look at Gurgaon, for example, sort of Maruti went there one day and then the entire hub came about uh, because of Maruti, the whole ancillary sector. So I think sort of once you have a certain minimum threshold, uh, of, of large sort of firms, you will see the whole ecosystem sort of develop around it, uh, which will open up again a lot of opportunities for, for firms to feed into, in a sense, that hive uh, and, 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 and go and, and, and make Got it. If to tie it all up, uh, so the other thing that broadly affects everything that you have mentioned in the report is also uh, sort of the policy stance of the government. It could be anybody. Uh, if you were to take a big picture yeah. view in terms of how the policies have fared in the last, call it a decade, um, and also mm -hmm. slightly taking a, a step back and looking from the time we recovered from the 2008 crisis because India wasn't really too deeply impacted by the crisis because we weren't really integrated into the global financial system. So if you were to yeah. take a look from, call it 2008 and till 2022, how do you make sense of the policy landscape in terms of whatever we have done to increase savings, uh, entrepreneurship, so on and so forth. And also like if you had the power to change anything in a given day, what would you change? Oh, the second question is actually very easy. <laughs> I'll have a minister, a new cabinet minister, whose job is to cut down other ministers. <laughs> so, so uh, it's, it's absolutely clear. I mean, we need somebody who's just going to cut, uh, make make a lot of jobs irrelevant in the bureaucracy. Uh, so, I think uh, so. That's the sort of the easiest question. I think if you sort of uh, step back, uh, we responded. We panicked a bit in 2008 mm -hmm. when the global financial crisis hit. And as you said, we weren't as integrated in, into the world system then as we are now. Uh, the financial se sector was. Uh, the financial sector got disproportionately impacted. But the real India, in a sense, wasn't as impacted. But we responded to a huge fiscal stimulus. Uh, and that, in a sense, sort of uh, escalated into sort of uh, the 2013 
sort of the taper tantrum crisis uh, as we call it and sort of the currency fell by 20 percent uh, we had a five percent current account deficit and then uh, we had to overnight raise interest rates uh, when rajin came in and so on uh, but if you sort of look at it from post thereafter uh, the last couple of years of the UPA government, when they had a tight rein on fiscal deficit uh, and the sort of the rein so far, uh, it's been it's been sort of the consistent policy to uh, to liberalize, to cut taxes. So the corporate tax rate in India has sort of gone down. Uh, the tax system has got simplified. We moved to a GST, which is a far efficient tax system than the earlier uh, sort of various different taxes at the center and state level. Uh, sort of the whole thrust on making India an ease of doing business. Uh, so all of these are sort of uh, steps in the right direction. The only complaint if I had was that we're not moving fast enough on 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 several of these uh, factors. So there is a lot more um, lot more to be done on some of these things than than we achieved uh, so far. Uh, and as somebody who's sort of set up a company as running company, something as simple as set up a company, sort of I can see that okay, it's now become easier. But there's so much more that we done to make it simple to just simple register a company. Uh, so I think there is a lot of things that you can do to make it easier. I mean, I, as somebody who believes in, in in free markets, wealth in an economy is created when two people transact. Right. Uh, because they do transact because it is it is both of them find value in making that transaction. And sort of the more the transactions that happen in the economy, the more the wealth that gets created. And the more that sort of wealth that creates, the more then you can you can decide how to distribute that wealth. You can then have taxes that uh, distribute it. Then you can have a basic income. You can have a PDS. So all of that can be funded uh, if you have uh, have that. But the sort of the premise has to be that there has to be a lot more transactions that happen between two willing private sector uh, private entities or individuals. I think if you sort of focus on that. And sort of make it easier to do business either within India, between India and outside. I, I think uh, we'll sort of achieve that goal of getting to eight to ten percent GDP. The final thing I want to pick your brains on is this in-moment topic of inflation and central banking, uh, because most mostly investors and the market watchers tend to worry about it. But I think uh, because some of the founders and startups will also be listening to it. Uh, it also affects them because inflation is a regressive tax, which kind of eats into the, dis- uh, the, the discretionary spending of people, which means inevitably, indirectly, they will also be affected. So if you were to look at how our central banks have reacted, how our governments have reacted, and also uh, just to take a step back, this isn't really our inflationary pressures. We are also importing a lot of this inflation due to supply chains and you know all this fiscal spending in the US and other advanced economies. But uh, broadly speaking, are you like, how do you, how do, how do you grade our central banks and our policymakers in the response towards inflation? And also uh, from the last, let's say, three, four data releases, it kind of seems like we might be moderating. Like, what's your sense uh, in terms of where we are headed? Yeah, I think uh, it, uh, the data as it stands now does suggest that uh, we might be at the peak and, and, and things might be might be moderating uh, so on. But sort of we've seen, I mean, for example, the supply chain shortages was first talked about in 2000. Was supposed to be transitory. Then, right. then in 2021, it was supposed to be transitory, and now we are sort of in 2022, and we are still saying that it's transitory. So yes, I mean, so the data is is encouraging, but uh, but uh, fingers crossed, uh, so to say. But I think uh, sort of it's clear to me that uh, central banks across the world have been too slow to react. Uh, I think it's sort of the one thing that 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 uh, we need is is low and stable inflation. Uh, that's sort of at the heart of uh, of, of Part of from a monetary perspective, from from the currency perspective, and from the financial stability perspective. If you have low and stable inflation, then everything else follows. You can keep interest rates low. Uh, you you don't need to ha- make an abrupt change in interest rates that will take businesses by by sha. You don't impact the poor, for example, who are disproportionately impacted by by higher inflation uh, and so on. So I think it it is imperative for every central bank to ensure that uh, they they stick with to their mandate of low and stable inflation and sort of across the globe, I think uh, there's hardly any central bank which has managed to stick to that mandate. So in a sense, it's, it's been disappointing that uh, they've been uh, caught napping with this. Pandemic. Got it. Thank you so much. That was my final question. It's been a brilliant you know, learning experience for me. I'm pretty sure the people who are listening to will also have plenty of takeaways. So thank you for taking the time and doing this. I really, really appreciate this. Thank you for being It was a pleasure speaking with you.